the fellow knew that it was over for him. And so he didn't struggle when they led him to the room and tied him down. Recalled a 72-year-old farmer, then a medical assistant at the uh, Japanese army unit in China in World War II. But when I picked up the scalpel, that's when he began screaming. I cut him open from the chest to the stomach, and he screamed terribly, and his face was all twisted in agony. He made this unimaginable sound. He was screaming so horribly. But then finally he stopped. This was all in the day's work for the surgeons. But it really left an impression on me because it was my first time. This was taken from the New York Times interview with Unit 731 Medical Assistant. As I've stated in previous writings about the war crimes committed in Nanking in the early 20th century, Japan's brutal fuckery around the time of World War II seems to be glossed over in comparison to all the press the Germans received over their internment camps. I personally think the human brain can only process one massive exterminatus at a time, and when folks read about Nazis sticking people in the you know, giant easy bake ovens and running up enormous gas bills in the process, their brains shut down just to deal with that particular amount of information. See, they weren't paying attention to the fact that a Japanese doctor was doing his best to concoct the ultimate biological weapon and testing it out in the local population, killing hundreds of thousands of people like some psycho warlock with a murder boner. Or was it the, uh... Was it that a particular nation decided to maybe cover this man's actions up because he offered them something they couldn't refuse? Ooh, I mean, that's... Get your fucking conspiracy helmets on, boys. Because, uh... Well, not really, because this article's not going to go that deep. You know, we got, we got time constraints. I'll be honest, it's uh, 10.51 right now, and I got work in the morning, so we can't go that far into it. But holy shit... Anyone with a black, white, no gray sense of justice, you're going to hate the story. So, enough introductory bullshit. This is the story of Shiro Ishii and the death labs of Unit 731. I was going to title this the uh, Asian Auschwitz, but you know, I saw some dude already took that idea. So then I thought about Angel of Death, but uh, the fucking guy looks more like the neckbeard of death or some shit, so that's it. That's why we were... We went with Neckbeard of Death. I think it fits. So on to the Neckbeard of Death. Shiro Ishii was born in Chiba Prefecture, Japan on 25 June 1892. There isn't much known about the guy before his commissioning and service as a surgeon in the uh, Imperial Japanese Army in 1921. However, from the look of the guy in, in uh, his pictures, I'm willing to wager he wasn't the biggest hit with the ladies and probably spent a lot of time jerking off into his socks, you know, he, that he found after being stuck into a locker by the Aikido team at high school. But it, it was all right. Because Shiro, see, Shiro didn't need people for friendship and all that lame shit. He had bacteria. While he was living his best nerd life in college, his peers would note that he would refer to the bacteria he grew in his petri dishes as pets, rather than just the furry booger critters that they were. Shiro probably thought that by referring to the bacteria as a pet, you know, he would get the women in his class to have the same reaction as women who see a man on the beach with a puppy. Yeah, you know, because bacteria just makes broads gushing fucking wet and desiring his short sword thrust vigorously into their sheath to uh, receive his massive a samurai spirit. But nah, the girls just stuffed his bitch ass into the locker and then they went out to get their pussies pounded by the kendo team. You're, you're noticing the theme here with Shiro. I mean, I can't confirm that, you know, that he was like this, but I'm gonna take a wild guess. 
You know, just just a little conjecture. I mean, prove me wrong. You can't, because you don't have any evidence either. So, whatever. All jokes aside, Ishii knew his shit when it came to viruses and bacteria, and was a surgeon captain by 1925. A few years later, he noticed that all the other big boy nations had chemical and biological weapons programs, and Japan severely lacked in comparison. So, in 1928, Ishii took a trip over to the west side of the world and conducted substantial research into biological and chemical warfare. His research impressed his superiors so much that promotions just they just rained down upon him, and he finally made enough cash to replace his high school masturbation socks with, um, you know, inflatable fuck toys or something. You know, dudes, hook, dudes hooking up with human sized dolls is actually a thing in modern Japan. So I don't know if it was a thing back, you know, say 1940, not 40, 1925, but it's definitely a thing now. It's kind of sad, but you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. So, by 1932, the IJA, which is the Imperial Japanese Army, I'm not writing that shit out, and I'm not going to read it, you know, read it out either. You know, we're just going to call them the IJA from now on. Managed to arrange a way to invade Manchuria, J- China. I, was, I almost called it Japan. They wanted it to be Japan. They almost did. They blew up their own fucking train track, basically. So, you know. Like, barely, because they didn't really want to actually repair the damn thing, but they blew it up just enough to accuse the Chinese of doing it. You know, then they just said, you know, fuck it, bonsai, and just invaded Manchuria after the Chinese were like, hey, we didn't blow that shit up. And they're like, we don't care. We're gonna, we're, we're coming anyway. Okay, we just needed some loose reason to do, the, do so. So, I shit you not, they false flagged the hell out of it. Now, this turned out to be the perfect for Ishii because he had been tasked with coming up with biological weapons for Japan at this point, but he didn't have a place that he could do it in Tokyo without getting in trouble. A lot of governments, despite the government being assholes, usually run into issues when they start testing shit on their own people. You know, it's kind of frowned upon. But, you know, testing it on the Chinese, well... I'm guessing the government's official, well, unofficial stance on them was, well, fuck them. Go right ahead. Have at it. So he started experiments in a prison camp called Zongma. The shit that went down inside the uh, inside was kept so secret that construction workers were allegedly shot after their work was completed to keep it all hush-hush. The Kinpeitai, the Japanese military police and the secret police, supplied the doctor with prisoners. These people varied from the ordinary criminal to just whomever the government thought was talking too much shit that day. The prisoners were fed meat and rice and a couple of shots of sake, but this wasn't done out of pity for what was about to occur. They just wanted that the subject healthy for better test results. When the testing began, subjects were draining their blood over the course of days, and their deteriorating physical condition was noted. They were deprived of food and water and injected with plague bacteria and other micro, little micro critters. In one case, a subject developed a fever of 104 degrees. The doctors thought, you know, they figured it'd be pretty fucking metal. Maybe we can go ahead and give a couple of sacrifices to Nurgle. You know, I had to throw my Warhammer 40k in there. To see if, what does a fever look like on the inside of a person's body? while they were still alive. So, while the guy was unconscious, they perform a vivisection. For the ignorant, they basically cut him open. It's a fancy word for cutting him open. Likely without anesthesia, so it wouldn't have an effect on, you know, what they wish to observe. They figured that the anesthesia would be, you know, might fuck up their uh, observations. So better to get it raw, you know what I mean? Life expectancy at the camp was roughly a month, and if the subject survived an experiment but lacked the fortitude to continue in his great sacrifice for the Emperor, they were executed. I mean, what? You, you thought they were just going to let him go? I mean, come on, come on, man. You know, stay, stay ahead. Think, think, think. That wasn't going to happen. Fortunately, 
This camp had at least one hard fuck that just wasn't about that rat, that lab rat life. A Mr. Lee managed to kick his guard's ass, snatch the keys, and start a damn riot. Forty inmates were set free, and while many of them were shot or recaptured, a few got away and started snitching their asses off about the fuckfest that was Zong Ma. Not one prior and eyes looking into the camp, the IJA shut the camp down. And Shiro's operation was upgraded to a swank new site in Pifang, China. As a cover to the public, the place was officially called the Epidemic Prevention and Water Purification Department of the Kongtong army, but to the Kempei Tai and Shiroishi, it was Unit 731. So, for the sake of YouTube here, and obviously a lot of this stuff I can't show you on YouTube, you're going to have to go to my site. This is not dropping, you know, my site's name for advertisement. You're literally going to have to go there. www.grimskull.com. Duh. I can't show you the rest of what's going to happen. I will describe it. It gets graphic. I will, I will try my best in the edit to kind of give you an idea what's going down. But a lot of stuff, just like with Nan King, I can't go too graphic with it. I don't know YouTube's rules. I'm trying to be a good boy. But that's how we're going to roll. So, this is where we start to go all grimdark. So, you know, go ahead and grab your balls, your ovaries. Or whatever amalgamation of that you have, and let's roll on it. Once established in his new area, Ishii and his staff hit the ground running, looking for subjects in the local Chinese population for his plague experiments. The code name among the staff for the people taken was Maruta, meaning log in Japanese. This was thought to have originated as a joke among staff, you know, ha 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 ha, look, Yamamoto! This Chinese guy, he's so stiff, like log. <laughs> I call him log boy. Why, why my Japanese sound Mexican? I don't know. Anyway, so funny, ha ha. You know, you know, yeah. Okay, not the best accent, I get it. I get it. I sound like a fucked up speed racer, it's fine. It'll, it'll do. However, the program was called Holzklotz. I'm, which is a German word for log. So it wasn't just two dumbass nerds that came up with Maruta as a, as a joke. It was a whole pr government of program of, uh, it was a whole, I just screwed up my life. You big dummy, you big dummy, you big dummy, you big cold blooded dummy. You big dummy, see what you did? Oh no, you big dummy. I no, you big dummy. As you can tell, I don't really go back and edit all this. We're just going to roll with it. It was a whole government of dumbass pseudo samurai nerds that came up with all this mess. It should also be noted that whenever Ishii wrote about his results in peer-reviewed journals, he obviously omitted that his work was conducted on humans. He opted to refer to his subjects as non-human primates called Manchurian monkeys. Oh, Ishii, you're so clever. This fucking guy. Anyway. Men, women, and children were arrested by the Kempei Tai. Or kidnapped off the street and brought to Unit 731. As a lot of crazy happened once they entered the buildings, let's go ahead and break it down. So first, you had forced pregnancies. Female inmates were raped and forced to become pregnant to test the possibility of vertical transmission of diseases from mother to child. They were fond of using syphilis in this scenario. If the mother was not previously infected with the disease, they'd be sure to hook her up, you know, free of charge with a, you know, hit of the pox by forcing an, an infected patient to have sex with her. Quote, Infection of venereal disease by injection was abandoned, and the researchers started forcing the prisoners into sexual acts with each other. Four or five unit members, dressed in white laboratory clothing, completely covering the body with only eyes and mouth visible, handled the test. A male and female, one infected with syphilis, would be brought together in a cell 
and forced into sex with each other. It was made clear that anyone resisting would be shot. Damage to the mother's organs and the fetus survival rate was a point of interest to the researchers. But trust me, they really didn't care about the baby after the testing was complete. Many babies were born in Unit 731, and children were tested on as there were stories of seven-year-old Russian children. Remember, it wasn't just Chinese that were in there. In the compound for experiments. Still, as there were no survivors of Unit 731, the kids were either aborted or killed sometimes later. As for the mothers, they would just patch them up and use them again for other experiments, or just do what the Japanese did in Nanking. Quote, One of the former researchers I located told me that one day he had a human experiment scheduled, but there was still time to kill. So he and his other unit members took the keys to the cell and opened one that housed a Chinese woman. One of the unit members raped her. The other member took the keys and opened another cell. There was a Chinese woman in there who had been used in a frostbite experiment. She had several fingers missing and her bones were black with gangrene set in. He was about to rape her anyway. Then he saw that her sex organ was festering, with pus oozing to the surface. He gave up the idea, left, and locked the door and later went on with his experimental work. I want you to think about that. This woman is missing fingers. Her bones were black. But the pus oozing her for, from her vagina is what gave this guy pause. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, I forgot, I guess the guards, uh, the guards apparently called the genitals of the female prisoners, quote, jam-filled buns. I mean, I'm a fucked up person, but that, that, that's pretty goddamn brutal. The Enola Gay, just for your reference, is my screen wallpaper for a fucking month after reading that. And you know what? Hey, I hope, I hope some of these fuckers caught a face full of her payload. I'm just saying. If they had no other use for the women, they were vivisected at various stages of infection. They desired to see the damage syphilis does to the internal organs as it progressed into severity. Sometimes they would just let the syphilis go on to determine how effective treatment was over time. Now I'm not sure why, but the Tuskegee syphilis experiment comes to mind thinking about that. Now if you don't know what that was, the loose gist of it is that the doctors told black guys that they uh they didn't have syphilis or they it was treated and they weren't treating a fucking thing they just observed intensely fucked up but that's a tale for another day that is something that actually happened not really done for military experiments like this but an equally fucked up thing in history i want to google that next thing they did was weapons testing Now, thankfully, we men, you know, have glorious male privilege. So Ishii's staff would typically only use them once and kill them off. So, I mean, you know, that's something, right? At least the, at least the guys, you know, we got to check out early. They didn't really have much use for us outside of using us for our dicks. And that was about it. So if you had to die and were given the pick, I'd say weapons testing was a quick and metal as fuck way to go. Rotting in a cell with cancer or the bubonic diabetes? Fuck all that. Just get tied to a stake and have dudes toss grenades at you while to test out shrapnel patterns and, you know, impact damage. And I'm not kidding about that. That shit happened. They would also drop chemical weapons and virus bombs on subjects like they were fucking Horus from, again, Warhammer 40k. <laughs> clearing a goddamn planet clean of life just because, you know, the color didn't match his eyes. Flamethrowers, new bullets, samurai swords. Hey, they just need to know that shit will work before they send it out into operations in the army, and somebody had to test it. 
it just wasn't going to be the Japanese, so they volunteered some poor peasant for the job. Now, frostbite experiments. Quote, Once frozen, which testimony from a Japanese officer said, was determined after the frozen arms, when struck with a short stick, emitted a sound resembling that which a board gives when it is struck. Ice was chipped away and the area doused in water. The effects of different water temperatures was tested by bludgeoning the victim to determine if any areas were still frozen. Now me personally, I'm not sure what's complicated about frostbite. Toes freeze, you lose a toe. Hands freeze, lose a hand. I feel that they just conducted these experiments only to up their cut levels to over 9,000. Maybe they figured they, they would uh, have to fight Russia one day and winter would be a great time to do that. You know, they wanted to be prepared. I mean, because, you know, nobody's ever thought about, you know, fighting the Russians in winter. You know, they'll never see that shit coming. One of the doctors, Yoshimaru Hisato, would escort subjects outside, put their hands, feet, legs, dicks, probably, and whatever he could find dangling on a human body in freezing water and allowed the appendage to freeze. Then the following would occur. Fingers would be broken off, and if I recall, even frozen flesh pulled from the bones of living victims. You know, that last part, that could have been just a little bit of movie drama added to a film I saw on this topic, but I wouldn't put it past for these psycho doctors. Next chapter, disease and population infliction. Oh man, if you are a Nurgle, Nurgleite or whatever you want to call yourselves, this is this is your guy. This is this is your d disease guy right here, baby. The core of Ishii's work was to create a super plague to use against Japan's enemies. Hence, all of the bullshit aside, infecting his test subjects, watching them die, and trying to find a way to speed that shit up with his bread and butter. Hold on one second. This cat is. You better not meow. I don't hear you meow. You shouldn't have been in this room anyway. Get out. Get out. <laughs> I lost my spot because we had a cat invade. And I'm not going to cut that out. All right. Ishii had his crew breed fleas. Carrying strains of bubonic plague. Place them in baskets. And have low flying planes dump them on nearby villages. He later upgraded this delivery method to placing fleas in ceramic bombs. I wouldn't really call them bombs. They're more like cases. That would break on impact, on impact and not kill the fleas as an explosion would do, obviously. Within days, infection and deaths would occur, and Ishii's men would show up in hazmat suits and observe the chaos. These photos I will include right here. The... These photos are modern victims of anthrax, bubonic plagues, and cholera. It's one thing for me to say someone's infected with a disease. It's another thing for you to see it. And I'm pretty sure, you know, while you two might not like it, this is a factor of real life. They can deal with it. They would infect food and other supplies with cholera and place anthrax on candy and give it to the local children. Hell, I mean, they even gave motherfuckers uh, tularemia or what we know is rabbit fever. That disease appears to be rare as shit and mainly located in North America. So did he have that shit ordered by mail or something? I have no idea. But if it made your eyes bleed and violently squirt out of your anus, Shiro Ishii was more than happy to give it to you. So how did this all come to an end? Well, Initially, I intended for this story when I wrote it to be a two-parter, but that would that was going to lead me down a, into a lot of areas and a lot of deals that got made between MacArthur and Japan's Emperor Hirohito. I decided to just wrap it up as I know most people have short attention spans when it comes to reading these days and frankly, it's a lot. There's a lot going into it. I mean, but by the end of the war, 
Shiro Ishii dodged war crime charges because he had super cool biological research that made MacArthur's boner hard as fuck. The Soviet threat was looming on the horizon, and MacArthur definitely didn't want Stalin getting his hands on Ishii's data. So when the U.S. gave the man immunity from prosecution in exchange for his research, and he went on to live a carefree life until he died from throat cancer at the age of 67. So, if you were hoping for some kind of divine retribution or justice in this story, I am sorry to inform you that the world doesn't operate that way. Sometimes, you just get fucked over, and then, my friend, you die from mega bubonic ultra herpes. So I hope you folks have a great day, and be sure to tune into the channel next time. Take care.